So what have we been doing recently? Recently we've been doing transformations in the plane, 2D transformations, and transformations of R3. And the transformations of R3 we looked at, so this was last week, and maybe a little bit the previous week, was translations, rotations, well, translations and rotations and rescalings. And we had this idea, we had this idea of how, how do we, how do we describe rotations? Um, how do we describe rotations in three dimensions? Rotations in two dimensions are easy enough because you're just rotating about a point. Okay, so the point could be anywhere, but there's really only one direction to rotate in, anti-clockwise, or you can rotate through a negative angle, which will in effect move you <coughs> clockwise. <coughs> there's not a huge amount to say about rotations in two dimensions, but there's much more to say about rotations in three dimensions. Because in three dimensions, you rotate about a line. You have a rotation axis, which is a line in three dimensions. There's plenty of lines in three dimensions. They can be located anywhere, and they could be going in any direction. Yeah? So there's a lot of choice. There's a lot to describe. So we certainly don't give a general formula for this is what a rotation matrix looks like in three dimensions. And we don't describe each entry in detail in terms of the angle of the line and the amount of rotation and the where the line is and so on. There's just too much detail. I mean, you probably could do that, but it'd be a huge matrix, there'd be so many parameters in it. Uh, I don't, you know, certainly nothing you could remember. Um, I don't know how useful, you know, well, it will be useful, but we, we've adopted a different approach. So a kind of, a more, um, a more simple step-by-step -step approach is taken. And that's where we, we, we pick out three special types of rotation. The three special lines that we already have that are already floating around are the coordinate axis lines, the x, y, and z axes. Remember, left-handed coordinate system in that space. Um, yeah, sorry. I'll not fall into the trap of giving the previous lecture all over again. But just to say briefly, we talk about rotations about the x-axis, rotations about the y-axis, rotations about the z-axis. Those three basic types of rotation. And then with the aid of translations, we then have a method for describing any a rotation around any kind of line. Because <coughs> in general, so this, this figure of 5.2 is kind of the general picture. There is a line somewhere in three dimensions. It's not going through the origin, so it's located somewhere general. Two pieces of information for the line. The position vector of a reference point on the line and D, the direction vector of the line. How could we rotate three-dimensional space around that line using our three basic types of ro rotations about the x, y, and z axis? Well, we do it step by step. The first step is we drag the line back to the origin. We do that with the use of our reference point. We translate everything so that the reference point goes to the origin. We translate to the vector minus p. p is part of the data describing the line, so we've got P at our disposal, so we translate by minus P. Then we have a line going through the origin, okay? And then with the aid of a sequence of rotations, we rotate around the coordinate axis so that that line, D, is forced to lie along the z-axis, pointing in the positive direction of the z-axis. Then we carry out the original required rotation, so somebody asks you to rotate three dimensions around that line, by some certain angle theta, then we carry out the rotation around the z-axis. So that line has now been transformed to the z-axis, so we rotate around the z-axis now by whatever the specified angle at the beginning was. And then we have rotated three dimensions around that original line, but everything's moved around because we translated and rotated around the coordinate axis. So we've got to move everything back to where it ought to be. So we undo the rotation around the x-axis, the rotation around the y-axis, we undo the translation. So the original line goes back to where it was, but everything has been rotated by an angle uh, around it. Okay? So that's called the rotation sequence. So it's described in detail there in those five steps. And then we described in detail what the matrices looked like. And this was the final matrix R here. So R 
that's the general expression for our rotation around a general line in three dimensions. And you read it, and that's a, it's a multiplication of matrices representing a composition of transformations. So you read it from the right. So this T is the tra dragging the line so that it goes to the origin. We rotate around the Y axis, rotate around the X axis. After that third one has been applied, the line points along the Z axis. You then rotate around the Z axis by whatever the required rotation was, and then you undo the three, undo the first three operations. Okay. But you undo them, you know, it's last first. So you undo the X, you undo the Y, the, the rotation Y, and finally you undo the translation. So that's how we you know, carry out any any desired rotation. Okay. Was there any, any any questions that came up about that? So I demonstrated that last time with the aid of a little MATLAB script, which you can find on the Google Plus page. Um, I should have put the screenshot up, but I didn't. <coughs> So it was in the comments here to our spinning astronaut. So there's there's an example MATLAB script there, which just positions a cube in space, and I rotate the cube around one of the axes that joins opposite vertices in the cube. And we did that step by step using the rotation sequence. We programmed each of the individual rotation matrices around the axes. And so, on. so, you know, if you want more detail on that, or you want to relive that or re-examine that, have a look at that MATLAB M file there, run it, examine the code, understand how it's all put together to, to produce the desired uh, rotation. Okay. And then last week then I also, in the second half, we investigated them in rotations in three dimensions in a much more topological way. And there's a little demo video of me doing the rotation thing with the straps, there, uh, which blew everybody's mind. This one. Okay. So that was okay, so that's kind of a quick summary of that. Now we're into this thing of viewing pipeline and coordinate alignment. So this is underpinning the last two uh, assignments. The last two assignments were actually going to construct uh, a virtual village environment consisting of a number of buildings of certain types and a, there's a street. I'm asking you to construct a street, so a whole row of buildings as well. And this is a proper three-dimensional virtual environment. Next week, we're going to discuss uh, how we do the projections. But what the viewing pipeline is, is this process or, or <coughs> sequence of steps that takes you from the abstract virtual, the abstract model of the three-dimensional environment, which is like stored in the computer, how you drag that to ultimately uh, some kind of configuration that the screen can display. Because the screens are two-dimensional, the screens aren't three-dimensional. So there's a, you know, there's a number of steps that have to be gone through before you get a set of instructions which are <coughs> sent to the screen and which draws the image on the screen in a realistic representation of the three dimensions. Okay. So we'll just start to fill in some of the detail on that and introduce some terminology and some so at the beginning, our, our environment is made up of a number of objects. So at the very beginning, these objects need to be designed or specified. So each object, each fundamental object is kind of designed in its own object space. Okay. So thinking of the environment consisting of buildings or basic <coughs> building shapes, each basic building you want to have, so we've got a basic house here at the bottom, and maybe something that could be a church up here, maybe you know, some kind of tower at the end of the house, some more complicated thing. Um, so these are our basic building types we're using. Of course, the top one you can see is, consists of a house with just a tower shaped side. But the idea is that whatever your basic building types are, they are specified and designed in their own space. Most sensibly, it makes sense to position them at the origin, so center them at the origin in some way, and if they're made out of planar faces, it probably makes sense to align those with the x, y, and z axes in the object space. Okay? 
We'll talk in detail now about how they are actually specified. But uh, well, they're specified by or designed by specifying the locations of the vertices of them, of the points at the various intersections, and then specifying what the planar faces should be. Okay, so this house would have um, well, it's four planar faces around the sides, and then the two planar faces for the two sides of the pitched roof. So there'd be six, six faces in total, I guess, defining that simple house shape at the bottom. Okay. So it's it's defined in two ways by by defining the location of locations of the vertices, done using vectors, and then defining the faces as just sequence of the <coughs> sequence of sequences of vertex labels. So this front-facing wall of the house here is, say, going from vertex 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. It'll have certain labels attached to it. This front part of the pitched roof would be from vertex 1 to 2, and maybe that's 6 and 7 at the top. Okay? So just lists of labels and vertices will specify the polygonal faces of the objects. So that's each object living, you know, defined by itself, centered at the origin and aligned with the coordinate axes. <clears throat> and then you want to then you want to build your virtual environment. And you build the environment by by populating your environment with many copies of the basic object types. Okay? So there's a little village of one church and two houses. Okay? <clears throat> now we don't define separately each house on its own and define separately the church, we use the basic types that we've already got defined in their own object spaces. Okay. But in, in the object spaces, these things are located at the origin and they're aligned with the coordinate axes. Whereas when you build your environment, you want to place them in certain locations and they don't, you, you might necessarily want them aligned with the coordinate axes. You might want to rotate them slightly. <clears throat> and maybe you want a few big houses and a few small houses, so you might want to scale them up or scale them down. Or a few long houses, you might want to scale the house in one of the directions, and, you know, like a barn or something. So by, with the combination of appropriate rotations and scalings and translations, we move copies of these basic object types into, into our environment. <laughs> So then that gives us a that gives us the world space. So the world space consists of a load of vertices. Okay? Every vertex of every object. So we have the positions of all these vertices in the world space specified with vectors. And then what you actually see when you're looking at it is you see a collection of polygonal faces. You know, faces, the sides of the houses, and so on. Um, and those are specified by just simply sequences of vertex labels. Okay. Now remember this, you know, specifying things is made up of polygons. It isn't really, it doesn't really limit you in what you can represent because in, in our introductory lecture we saw some very realistic, almost photorealistic images or three-dimensional models. There's one of Obama and there's another one of a, of a young girl. And they looked almost like photographs because they were made up of millions of polygons or hundreds of thousands of polygons that were incredibly small. So although these look very simple and very uh, naive kind of sophistication here, but you know, you just make everything smaller, increase the number of vertices, increase the number of polygons, and you can get you know, realistic effects. <clears throat> okay, now we're we're looking at a little a diagram of that world space here, but the question is, you know, at, at this point it's just a collection of positions, a collection of 3D vectors of vertices, and a collection of lists of vertex labels specifying the planar faces. So how could it ever get to being, being rendered on a two-dimensional screen? So those are the other two fundamental uh, types of operation. So the first one of those is called aligning the viewpoint. Now, in this final image here, which is our final rendered 3D view of the environment, we're looking, how is that arrived at? We're, we're, we're looking at the village from some point in the world that the village is. Okay? So we're some distance outside the village looking back towards it. Okay? So there's two pieces of information that are needed for that. The position of the viewpoint 
which ultimately you could think of as the position of the eye of the observer. That's somewhere in the that's somewhere in the world space, and it's looking in a certain direction. So you either need a viewing vector, or a position of a center of view, and then you can formulate the viewing vector as the vector joining the viewpoint and the center of view. So typically, there's, there's a viewpoint located some distance outside the village, and there's a center of view to some central point in the village. A certain height above the ground, and that's the, the actual, that's a point which lies along the line of sight of the, uh, of the viewer. Now, we're avoiding the subtleties that actually happen that, you know, when we actually look at things, we, we most of us have two eyes, so we see one view and one very slightly different view, and our brain puts, our mind puts those together and gives us our image that we have in our minds. We're avoiding that 3D stereoscopic view, so just think of looking at something with one eye only. Then you just really, really you just have a single viewpoint. Maybe it's not me. Okay, you've got a pupil which is letting in the light, so maybe it's not exactly a viewpoint. But for simplification purposes, we'll think of it as just as your pupil being just a single point. Okay. So to set up this final view, we need in our environment somewhere a viewpoint and a center of view, a viewpoint and a direction of sight. And that's the information needed to to arrive at the final projection. And there's two main operations. The first one is to simply align the viewpoint. So remember when we were talking about the three-dimensional rotations? We avoid talking in complete generality and we agree to always carry out rotations around the z-axis. If we want to rotate around something else, we first drag it onto the z-axis. Let me do the rotation about the z-axis and let me send it back. Okay, so the actual rotations only happen around the z-axis. Well, for a similar simplifying or kind of organizing principle is that when we produce a view of the environment, we're, we imagine ourselves always positioned at the origin looking down the z-axis. That's always going to be the case. Now, of course, that's too restricting if you could only do that. So what if you want to, a view from a general <coughs> viewpoint looking at a, at a general, uh, in a general direction? So you've got the viewpoint and a line through the viewpoint. Well, you just drag the viewpoint to the origin and send the viewing vector, rotate around so that that's then pointing along the z-axis. So that process is called alignment. Okay? We'll talk about that in detail in a moment. That's the kind of, uh, that's the kind of uh, meat of this chapter is to examine that in detail, the things involved in that stuff. So what that does is it takes the three-dimensional environment, it translates it, and rotates it around so that the viewpoint is now positioned at the origin, standard setup, and it's looking directly along the z-axis. <clears throat> and then the final operation of projecting to the screen is carried out. Okay? And there are various ways in which that projection can take place. Okay, what's indicated there is probably the perspective pr projection which produces a realistic uh, image on the screen. Okay? So things close to the viewpoint appear large, things far away from the viewpoints uh, appear small. Okay? Those of you who have looked forward to the perspective projection will notice the shot from Father Ted. Everybody remember the, the cow scene in Father Ted? Anyway, I'll save that joke for next week when we're, when we're going through it. But anyway, so perspective projection is when you know things that are close to the viewpoint are large, obviously, and things that are far away are small. That's not the only way to do projections. And then in, in other, you know, when, when you're not when you're not just interested in producing realistic, you know, realistic looking images for enjoyment or computer games or whatever, for other purposes, the perspective projection is quite confusing because, yeah, things that are large in reality, cows, were well, well, Thing that on the perspective projection they can appear tiny if they're far away, but sometimes you, you sometimes you want things to appear as their correct size in the in the projection. It's often used in technical drawing or architectural drawing, or when you're planning things out, you, you want things to appear in the proper way according to their size. So so there are other types of 
projections. We'll consider some of those in the, uh, in the uh, projection chapter. Now, again, I'm kind of hiding some detail here because also there's a lot, there's quite a few other steps gone on to produce that final projection, let's say. See, our abstract model of the environment just consists of vertices in certain positions and planar faces. Once you've done the projection, what the projection does is it takes the vertices, which are in the three-dimensional space, and it projects them all onto the two-dimensional plane of the screen. So then your world consists of just a number of points on the screen. And you still got the plane, you still got the definitions of the polygons as lists of vertices. So then that gives you a, a bunch of vertices on the two-dimensional screen and a load of polygons drawn amongst them, which are the faces of the buildings. But now, there's a lot more detail gone into that image there, because that image shows some polygons as being at the front, and, some, and those ones at the front obscure the ones that lie behind them. Okay. So that's a process. Now, the, the algorithms needed to calculate and uh, sort that act about which polygons can the viewer actually see, which ones are <coughs> which ones are completely obscured because they're at the backs of things. For instance, I can't see the back of the tower, the other two faces of the tower, because they're on the other side. That process is called the, the back face culling, back face culling, filling off the faces that the viewpoint actually can't see. And then there's also something where I can see parts of some polygonal faces. So one of those in the final view there, this front house is obscuring the side of the church. So I can see part of the side of that church. Again, that, that process of sorting out which things are in front and which things are behind, we need algorithms to sort, to sort that out. Then there's also some different shading or coloration applied to the building there. Okay, it's just levels of gray perhaps there in that actual image we're looking at. But in general, you might want a realistic image on the side of your objects to make them look like some kind of real object. Okay? That's, that process is called texture mapping. So taking some kind of specification of, the, the, of how the polygon should look, what kind of image one should see on the polygon, and applying that to the final uh, projected view as well. Okay, that's called texture mapping. Those processes are some of the things that John will be uh, dealing with in turn two. Okay? So if you look on page 38, this final uh, section in rendering to, the, rendering to the screen, John's going to deal with those in, uh, in the second term. The bits we're going to deal with take us up to, and if you look in the assignments, in the assignment five, See, these are the kind of two-dimensional images we're going to produce. So this is a very simple village just consisting of two houses. This, this, viewpoint, this view is the view from above of it, a plan view of the village. One house here, another house here. Those lines are the ridge of the roofs you see. In our assignment, we're going to be producing images like this. Okay, a bit more complicated because your environments are going to have more buildings in them. But it's essentially this kind of wireframe view. So what hasn't happened here is any back face culling. We're still drawing the back face of the house, the rear gable of the house, even though we shouldn't see it in reality. Because in reality, it would be obscured by the front gable and the walls and the roof. Okay? But we're still going to draw it because we're not, in this term, we're not considering the algorithms to, to, to obscure that. And, and it's just a wireframe model. We aren't applying any texture or coloration to the faces either. They're kind of all clear, transparent uh, polygons that we're going to draw. But um, and some examples I'll show you, and, and the ones that you're going to produce, they, they still look uh, satisfactory enough, these wireframe models, and especially when we animate it. In the final assignment, when you animate it with a moving viewpoint, this kind of you're going to fly on an orbit around your village, always looking back to the center of it. And you know, even though it's a wireframe transparent model, it's, it'll still look quite impressive when you get those final uh, animations out of it. Okay. So 
it's all so far really it's 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 all been a bit descriptive and just terminology. So we're gonna make things a bit more precise now. And we're gonna look in detail at this process here, aligning the viewpoint. <clears throat> we don't have that much more to say about although I'll I'll be showing you lots of examples and showing you how we actually implemented a MATLAB and showing you the skeleton code for those assignments five and six, which take care of the uh, populating your environment with objects from your with basic objects from your object space. So these involve translations, scalings, and rotations. But today we're going to look at this process here, this uh, aligning the viewpoint uh, process. Okay, but to begin with, you know, something we're going to want to talk about where let's look at a basic object with this kind of s simple house shape. Okay, so <clears throat> I mean, here's how here's just a bit more detail on how you'd actually specify something like this. There's our basic house type. Okay, not it. It's not including this kind of uh, uh, stand that's kind of drawn in that it's sitting on. Just think of it as just the house shape. But you can see it's we've centered it at the origin, and we've, lo we've lined it up with the coordinate axes. Okay? So it's uh, some of the walls of the house are parallel to the z axis, and the others are parallel to the x axis. And the y axis is in the vertical direction of the house. Okay? Um, it takes 10 vertices to <clears throat> to describe this house. Eight for the basic rectangle, so four for the rectangular base, four for the rectangular top, and then an extra two at the uh, apexes of the roof. So uh, eight plus two, ten vertices in total, and these are the actual coordinates of them in the x, y, and z axes. So you got x, what you could probably just indicate here, so these columns are x, y, and z, are those columns. Now remember, the computer graphics convention is it's a left-handed system, and the y-axis um, the y-axis is the vertical one. So you notice four of the vertices have y-coordinate zero. Those are, that's vertices one, two, seven, and six on the ground. <clears throat> Another four of them have y-coordinate ten. That's vertices five, three, eight, and ten. Those are the, the ceiling level and the top floor. And then the final two vertices, 4 and 9, they have got y coordinate 15. So those are the apexes of the two roofs. OK, so that's the vertices of our basic uh, house object. That's just the vertices. The, the object actually consists of the planar faces. Okay, So those are specified using lists of vertex labels. So each vertex is labeled 1 through 10. So these rows here specify each of the planar face each of the planar polygonal uh, faces of the house. So the ones of length five are the two gable ends <coughs> which involve the vertices four and nine, the apexes of the roof. So those are the ones one, two, three, four, five, and six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All the other ones just consist of um, this consists of four vertex labels, and there are the other no, yeah, the four. Two of them are the vertical walls, and the other two are the two halves of the roof. Yeah, those those ones are just uh, polygons with four sides: so the two parts of the roof and the other two walls, uh, the two side walls of the house, as opposed, <coughs> to, as opposed to the gable walls. Okay, so that's a bit of detail on, on how we design the object in its object space. So positions of the vertices and lists of the vertex labels to describe the polygonal faces. <coughs> well, we are describing the uh, we are describing populating the world space as well. Okay, so once you've got all these objects in your object space, you can then Populate your world space with copies of these. So just quickly, how do we do that? Well, we formed for each object, we form a we form a matrix V, which is now using homogeneous coordinates. And this matrix has one column for each vertex. So 
the columns here are vertices of your object. And we're now using homogeneous coordinates. So we've introduced a fourth row of all ones. And remember, that means we can represent um, we can represent translations using matrix multiplication. Okay. <clears throat> so for each copy of the house shape, thinking of the house shape, so there's two copies here. But for any particular copy of it in your world space, you know the location you want to place the house at. You'll also specify the rotation that's needed. Do you want the object to be still lined up with the x and y axes, or do you want it to be offset at an angle to them? And you'll also specify some kind of scaling factor or factors. Maybe you want to scale the house up or down, or stretch it out in one of the coordinate axes directions. So once you've made that decision of where and how you want the house to appear, <coughs> You have some kind of sequence like this where you scale it, rotate it, and translate it into position. Now, the order is important here. The, the, yeah, scaling, maybe you could change, interchange the order of scaling and rotation. If you were scaling in the same amount in all coordinate directions, then yeah, the rotation and the scaling could be interchanged. But the translation is done last. Okay. If you translate it first, you move it away from the origin, and then you rotate around the origin. So then you're going to send it, you know, you send it along an arc. But really, you, you, we want to rotate it, get it to its correct alignment, and then translate it into position into the world space. Okay. So assuming that, that this house over here in the world space is not located at the origin, in the object space, remember the house is centered at the origin. So here you've got some house at some arbitrary position. So maybe you want to scale the house. Resize it. Maybe you want to change its rotation against the x and y and z axes, and then you want to translate it into position. I mean, in this simple kind of model where it's a flat ground, this rotation would, would I guess, just be a rotation around the y axis. Yeah. So you're not going to tilt the house up or down around the x or z axis. You're just going to change its rotation, how it's dropped on the ground. So that's a rotation around the y-axis. OK, so that fills your world. So when you do that multiple times, multiple copies of the house, maybe some other kind of building types, that populates your environment. So you have one of these large vertex matrices, V, for each object. Now we're going to describe the alignment. Okay. So this is the this this the alignment works with the data that's needed to produce the view. So that's two things: the position of the camera or the viewpoint, and the viewing direction vector, which typically you you define by by giving a point, which is the center of view, the the point at which the viewer is looking. So. Um, what do we do? So we've got vectors uh, C and V. So the viewpoint or the virtual camera is located at position with vector V, and the center of view is the vector C. So that means if you look at the difference of those, if you form the vector D, which is C minus V, that's the viewing direction. That's the vector describing the, di the direction along which the viewer is looking. Okay. And what is the process of alignment? The process of alignment is summed up in this final paragraph here. We want to take the viewpoint and drag it to the origin. Okay, we achieve that by translating every object in the world space by the correct translation vector so that the viewpoint moves to the origin. Okay, so that will be translating by the vector minus v. Um, and then we want to, so then we'll have the viewing vector d is now, think of coming out of the origin. Now we want to align the, or rotate that onto the z-axis. We do that just as we did for the arbitrary rotations last week. We do that by rotating around the y-axis and then around the x-axis. So it's a yaw rotation followed by a, a, a pitch rotation in the language of the, uh, the language of the airplanes last week. Okay. So here, here is a bit more detail on that. So the starting off, you've got some arbitrary 
view point V away from the origin, some center of view, which is, so this is our house here. It's a bit, okay, it looks more like an arrow to be kind of squashed. But. So here's the viewpoint. We're looking at this point on the, on the gable end of the house. So the alignment, you first translate everything. So that moves the viewpoint to the origin. <coughs> then rotate it around the y-axis, meaning, meaning we rotate all the position vectors of the vertices in the world space around the y-axis. And then rotate down onto the z-axis. Okay, so that the that's the final the diagram at the bottom. So here you see the viewing vector, which goes from the viewpoint to the center of view. This is now aligned with the z-axis, and that's the conventional setup we want to have before we do the projection and the rendering onto the screen. Okay. Remember, the convention is that, that you think of your x, y, and z axes. The X and Y are parallel to the, the horizontal and vertical edge of the screen, and the Z axis is, is the, the direction into the screen. Well, this, this setup is now aligned with that convention. If the viewer is here looking at the world over there, it's going to be exactly lined up with the X and the X, Y, and Z axis. So X and Y are the screen. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the projection in detail next week. We'll be position of viewing the screen slightly in front of the viewpoint um, and project everything onto the screen. So this is the situation aligned with the origin and the, and, and the Z axis. Right? Okay, on the following page, there's a bit more, there's two different, I mean, it's hard to represent these processes in the two-dimensional page like that. There's two other views of the sequence there, a, a top view and a side view. So the previous view was attempt to kind of view all three of, excuse me, all three of the coordinate axes at once. Um, but over here we've got a top view. So this is the view just looking at the XZ plane. So the Y axis is coming straight out at you here. So you're hovering above the origin, looking down at a planned view of the world. And the other view is a side view. So there you're looking at the Y and Z plane uh, from a point along the X axis. Uh, actually looking at a point from the negative side of the X axis. Okay, because you've got Y going up and Z going to the left. So you're actually positioned this side view at a point of the negative uh, side of the X axis. Is that right? If you're a positive, the Z will be coming out to the right. The Z's coming out to the left, so that means it must be on the negative side of the X axis. Okay. <clears throat> so is that okay? Does that everybody understand that or appreciate what's going on there? Okay. Aligning the world, the viewpoint and the viewing vector, transforming the whole world so that the viewpoint is at the origin and the viewing vector is along the Z axis. Now, when you actually want to implement this thing, you then have to get down to the level of talking about the specific transformation matrices and specific angles and so on. Okay? And that's all going to come from the vector information. So, um, so what's the translation matrix going to be? Well, it's just going to be the standard translation matrix for three dimensions, but expressed in terms of homogeneous coordinates. So it's a four by four matrix. And it's all ones and zeros apart from these entries in the final column. And those we get from the coefficients of the viewing of the position vector V, which is the, pos the position vector of the viewpoint. So we're translating by minus V to drag V to the origin. So we we have the entries minus Vx, minus Vy, and minus Vz in the translation matrix. <clears throat> and then we've got two rotations that we want to do. Rotating around the y-axis first, and then rotating around the x-axis. And we would like to, like to describe we would like to describe the entries of those matrices in terms of in terms of the information in the setup. Okay, so let's talk about talk about how we do that.
Okay, so for the first rotation, the rotation around the y-axis, this is the rotation that's going to take the viewing vector, which is now coming out of the origin, and it's going to rotate it around the y-axis so that it now lies <coughs> in the yz plane. So the general position is that the viewing vector is coming out at some general angle. We're going to rotate around the y-axis. The y-axis is my index finger. We're rotating around the y-axis so that the viewing vector now lies on the xz plane. So my middle finger and index finger define this plane, which extends out straight out that way. You want to rotate the viewing vector so that it lies in that plane, directly above the z-axis. The, the next rotation will be to rotate it down onto the z-axis. Okay, but first of all, we want to go around the y-axis. So here's the general viewing vector D, shown as this uh, front end of this shaded segment here. And we want to rotate it around so that it appears like this black arrow vector here, which is supposed to lie on the yz plane, which is kind of disappearing into the page there. And to get a precise view of things, we'll do this, we'll this, we'll do this plan view. So the y-axis is coming straight out of the origin at me there, and we're seeing the x and z axis here. <coughs> so you, now we can see the precise description. We, this is, the, this is the angle theta that we want to rotate by around the y-axis. So if we rotate three-dimensional space around the y-axis, remember the y-axis is coming straight out of the origin there, that will send the vector d and we'll put it above the z-axis. And this diagram shows you the various components. So you can see the x-coordinate of the viewing, the, the x-component of the viewing vector d is this one here, the z-component. You can see that here. Now, but what's the what's the length of that vector that is, is drawn on the page? That isn't the length. It isn't the length of the viewing vector d. It's the length of the projection of d down onto down onto the xz um, down onto the xz plane. So let me just switch to the camera. So in this figure 6.10, so just add something to that. That quantity W, what's it written as? W, W1. So W1 there is the length of the projection. The projection of D onto the XZ plane. Now, how, how exactly is that expressed in terms of the vector d? Well, if we've got the viewing vector d in component form, dx, dy, dz, then that length of the projection is the square root of the sum of the squares of dx and z components. Okay. So w1 is the square root of the sum of the squares of dx and dz. Okay. So you just... Temporarily, forgetting about the y component, just looking at how d is in relation to the x and z coordinate axis. Okay. That's equivalent to projecting d straight down onto the ground xz plane. So theta, the, the angle theta can be recovered <coughs> using some kind of inverse some inverse trigonometric function. Trig, trig, o, trig no metric function. I mean, there's various ways you can do it. You could some you could use inverse tan, a tan. You could use inverse cos, a cos, or inverse sine. Remember, sine, cos, and tan. They take angles to ratios of sides of triangles, but in this diagram, in 6.10, you're starting by looking at the triangles. You want to recover the angle, so you can use one of the inverse um, inverse trigonometric uh, functions. Now, a useful MATLAB option, but you also have to take ca taking care taking care of which quadrant 
of the XZ plane D is in, or the projection of the viewing vector D is in. Let's be careful about that. I mean, in, in the in the diagram in the notes, D is drawn that it's in the first quadrant, the positive X and positive Z. But in you know, in general, it could be in one of the other three components. So you just want to make sure that whatever kind of inverse trigonometric function you use, remember these trigonometric functions. <clears throat> um, they're not one to one, you know. The, you know, cosine of some angles agrees with cosine of other angles, and so on. Similarly for sine, so you want to make sure you're recovering the correct angle. So you may need something which detects, which detects which of these quadrants you're in. So you, you can detect which quadrant you're in by looking at the signs <coughs> of dx and dz. But now, a useful MATLAB way to do this, and in, or in your other computer software systems are available, um, a useful MATLAB function for this is ATAN2. Now, ATAN2 doesn't take just the, uh, it takes two arguments. So it doesn't take just the ratio of the sides, it actually takes the, the coordinates itself. So what ATAN2 does is whatever point with coordinates x and y, ATAN2 gives you this angle. Gives you this angle theta. <coughs> Sorry, I won't call that theta because I don't want to confuse it with the theta in 6.10. I'll call that phi. Well, that angle is phi, just because theta is in the air at the moment. Um, so a tan 2 gives you this angle phi. The angle phi defined by the position of this point, the, the radius to this point, and the x-axis. And it gives it to you in the range minus pi to pi. <coughs> so for points in the top half of the plane, you get positive angles. For points in the bottom half of the plane, you get in ne in negative angles. So it's it's a nice angle. It's it's the angle that fits with the normal counterclockwise convention. <coughs> so you can recover the angle using a tan two the y of x. Um, so when you're actually coming to implementing these things, that's how you can recover the angle from the components of the vectors. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of the answer to six, exercise 6.1. We're rotating around the y-axis, so you can see the the general form of the y-axis there. So in answer to exercise 6.1, in exercise 6.1, you would use so if the rotation ma matrix is given to you there in general R y. You would use theta to be a tan two in the computer sense of, of what? Now be careful, it might be the x and y. Look, look back to the diagram we're looking at. It's not x and y we want. Well, x is playing the role of the x-axis in my specification of a times 2, but z is playing the role of the y-axis. However, it's not this angle here we want. It's actually this angle up here. So just be careful about that. So you actually want to kind of turn your head sideways and look at this picture. So we want this, the size of this angle really here. So it's going to actually be a tan 2 of dz dx. So there's, there's kind of plenty of places to stick in the wrong thing here. Um, a tan 2 in general gives you back angles from a pair of coordinates. But when you actually come to use it in any particular context, you want to carefully identify which two coordinates you're interested in and which is the first argument to A tan 2 and which is the second. <coughs> and because of the way the diagram 6.10 is drawn, the angle theta that we're looking at, see, it's the 
Sorry, Z, yeah, perfect illustration. DX, DZ, it should be. Because look, in the specification of ATAN2, the Y, because of the way they've designed it, the Y axis, the vertical axis in your picture, is the first argument. The horizontal axis is the second. And then the diagram for our theta is the vertical axis is X. The horizontal axis is Z, so you're looking at it from the side. So that's why the DX comes first and then the DZ. Mm -hmm. So this is the correct uh, this is the correct view. This here. DX DZ. So that's your angle theta, which you feed into the rotation matrix Y as you as you move there. Okay. <coughs> Let's just, just confirm that, that I wasn't misquoting it. Yeah, four quadrant inverse tangent, it's called. Just let's make sure that ordering of the arguments is correct. Yeah. P equals A tan to YX. And there's a little illustration down here. Yeah, so y x, or y is the vertical axis, x is the horizontal axis, and it gives it to you in the range minus pi to pi. So yeah, just confirming that description. <clears throat> okay, so that's, it. that's your matrix R y. After you've done that, you're ready to, you're ready to extract the, the necessary angle for the rotation around the x axis. So for that situation, you're looking at this diagram here, in 6.11. Now the viewing vector is in the yz plane. So when you look at it from a point on the x-axis, you can see the dz is one side of the triangle, the dy is the other side, and here's the angle phi that we want. But notice in the way we've set things up there, it's the left-handed coordinate system, we want to go clockwise rotation through that angle. So that's so we want to rotate through minus phi. Remember, counterclockwise is our default rotation direction. So if we're rotating clockwise by phi, we want to rotate by minus phi. Okay. So that's the rotation matrix we need Rx there. And we can extract the angle for that. Yeah, you see, if you compare this Rx with the Rx on page 33, you can see that the signs are in different positions. And it's not a mistake. It's because we're rotating clockwise by phi as opposed to anti-clockwise. So the signs, the signs of the G and the sign functions here, on page 33, the original specification of Rx for going counterclockwise, this one is a minus sign, and that one's a plus sign. But here we're going clockwise, so it's opposite. The cosine remains the same. The cosine of negative is the same as cosine of the positive. Okay. But again, using that four quadrant inverse tan function, a tan two, that would give us this necessary angle phi. We do a tan two dz dy. So that would be the answer to exercise. Um, 6.2. So 6.2, confirm the form of the matrix Rx. Exercise 6.2. The angle you want, phi, is a tan 2 uh, dy dz. Okay, and then that feeds into Rx. Oh, just be a little, yeah, sorry. The, there's plenty of scope for confusion. So we want to rotate clockwise by phi. So 
that's why the RX appears as it does, with the signs in slightly different positions than they were in the original uh, specification of RX. <coughs> so then, putting all of that together, then we get this overall, you can see that, we then get an overall uh, alignment transformation matrix, which is just the appropriate composition of those. So translating the viewpoint to the origin, rotating the viewing, well, rotating everything around the y-axis so that the viewing vector goes to the yz plane, and then doing the pitch rotation around the y-axis so that the viewing vector comes down onto the z-axis. After the application of those operations, we say the world space is now aligned, or the, or the viewpoint is aligned with the origin. And that's the, that's the state of the world space that you then feed into the projection procedure, which we'll talk about next week, which, which positions a viewing screen uh, slightly in front of the camera and then projects the image onto that viewing screen. <coughs> of course, with us, the viewing screen is behind the viewpoint. If the viewpoint is the pupil of your eye, your viewing screen is actually behind, it's on the back surface of your eye. That's where the image is projected onto. Actually, the image comes through upside down onto that, and your mind turns it around. But we will get into all of that in the next one. Okay? So, th so that's kind of the end point. This is the final alignment transformation matrix. And this is the kind of thing that you're asked to produce in the next assignment, in uh, assignment four. Okay. Any questions? Uh, any questions based on that? Or things I could clarify from that? I mean, things to look out for is, you know, the potential for getting confused is with the signs of these angles, just to do with the particular directions you're rotating in, because for this last one we wanted to go clockwise, whereas normally we talk about going counterclockwise, and then the use of these inverse trigonometric functions. I, I suggest you use that useful function a tan 2, which doesn't just take the ratios of the sides of the triangle, but takes the actual signed lengths of the sides of the triangle and gives you back the angle. But you, you have to use it very carefully. You have to, in each instance you're using it, you have to be very clear about what the first argument should be and what the second argument should be. Okay. So do refer back to the, the help information about a tan two. Okay. Um, that pretty much covers it for chapter six. So next week we'll talk about projections, and I'll probably next week as well have our first look at the actual skeleton codes and that for assignments for the last two assignments, assignments five and six. Okay, to produce your projected view of your village environment and an uh, animation of a rotating viewpoint of your environment. Okay, so in the rest of this afternoon session, I'm going to go back and support you with assignments um, three and four, maybe even earlier. Okay, so I've got this uh, further transformations problem, <coughs> further 2D transformations problem sheet, which I'll do more of in the second session. And then I'll also maybe do a bit of a workshop, workshop session. You want to be working on assignment uh, four, or finishing off your work on assignment three, and I'll go back and I'll go around and help people or answer queries as needs be. <laughs>